This is how I would enter. We've got all these touches. Here's another touch at the media line. Price comes off this touch, and you can see it closed on its high, which is a sign of strength, after touching this sliding parallel. Now it's taking out highs. What's it do? It goes right to the median line and, once again, fails utterly. But remember, there's plenty of guys out there that got long up here because it was a new high, which is why they got long here and why they got long here. And you can see each time they got long, they ran, the market ran their stops, which is why we went down here. That's why it's called a rolling chop. They're just getting chopped up. You just want to say no. Don't, 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 don't trade it backwards like that. That's just a bad idea. Okay, so what I want to do, I like this test. I especially like it. You, it's hard, probably hard for you to see, but this bar comes down and, touch it, and tests the same sliding parallel that held down here, down here, and it closes on its high, which is a sign of strength. It closes with what I call good separation, which means it closes near the high of the bar. That tells me that there are buyers down there in control of this market. If it comes back down and tests a sliding parallel, I want to get long. But i got to check the stop. Can I afford the stop? The way I look at stops is this way. I have a mental checkbook in front of me. When I want to take the trade, I go, okay, how big a stop is this? and what, How much is it going to cost me per contract? And I start to write out the check in my mind. And if, if, if it doesn't meet my requirements, if it's too big a check, I, I literally go, well, that's, that's too much. Never mind. I, I'm throwing this trade away. I'll find an, I'll just wait. Uh, I call buying another bar or looking, just look for another setup if you have to go to a different market. But if the check is too big, you should be thinking about that all the time. You want to risk enough that you can make money, but you never, ever, ever want to risk so much that you A, are crippled emotionally, and B, go, obviously go tap. You never want to lose your, your bankroll because once you lose your capital, you're out of the game. You know the Bond movie where the guy goes, I'm all in? Anybody you see that? See, you, can't, you can never do that. Even James Bond was stupid when he did it. And, he, and you know the first time he did it, he got tapped. And then, of course, the Americans came to his aid. But that's a different story. You never, there's never ever a situation where you can say, I'm all in, or I'm even 10% in. I'm, there's never, you should never be risking 10% of your account, ever, on anything, period. Because... Even if you have a royal flush, the other guy might have a royal flush with a better suit. There's just no point. Never take a bet that can make you bankrupt, ever. Or actually, you never want to take a bet, a, a, a bet or place a position that's going to actually put you in danger, even emotionally in danger. And let me tell you, if you lose 10% of your count on a trade, you'll be emotionally crippled. So please, don't do that. Always trade with stops. Put your stops in when you put your entry positions in. Never, ever, ever, ever take a trade without taking a stop. If that's all you walk out of here with, that will save you a fortune. Mental stops are useless. If you think you're good enough that you can use mental stops the rest of your life, give me your money, and at least somebody will like you when you're bankrupt. <laughs> because you will go bankrupt. And I teach at the Merck, okay, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Hundreds of traders, and I watch guys that don't use stops go bankrupt. Ten, guys that have 10 or $15 million in their account. So believe me, this guy's been trading 25 years. If you don't use stops, real hard stops, there will come a time when you'll freeze and you'll be bankrupt. So please, always use stops. Everybody. Period. There's nobody here or professional traders good enough to not use stops. Save yourself the time and the energy. So I take a look and I say, okay, I want to get in at 102.09, and how did I figure that out? I took a look at where price would come down the next bar or two and test this sliding parallel, and that's 102.09. Where's my stop? I don't use cash-based stops. That means I don't say, I'll risk $150. What I do is I will not take a trade unless I'm hiding underneath a swing low or a swing high, period. And the reason why is there'll be limit buyers down here, right here. There'll be limit buyers here. Now, I obviously can't put, afford to put my stop here, but I can afford to put my stop here, so I'm going to risk 9 plus 6 is 15 ticks on this trade. Everybody with me? And I'm going to use this. I'm going to hide underneath this a little bit, which is a volatility cushion, underneath this swing low, and there they should be limit buyers here. If I'm wrong, it'll run through here like, uh, I don't 
I don't know the phrase I can say over the air, but you know what I mean. It'll just plunge right through. People ask me what my losing trades look like. Generally, it's the next bar, and instantly I'm out. I'm stopped out. That's okay. That's what stops are for. That means I'm dead wrong. You just reset, look for another trade. But if the stop's small enough, you don't even blink. It doesn't bother you. That's why you should use quality stops, smaller size positions. All right, so now we know how to set up the trade. Now I put up here, how do I use multiple targets that make sense? Well, the truth is I never use multiple targets. But some of the people I mentor do, and one of my partners does as well, and some, a lot of guys at the Merck that I've uh, had in seminars do. So I'm going to show you one example that I, hopefully you'll immediately say, this doesn't make sense. And I'll show you another example that has some thought behind it, has some merit. I still wouldn't use multiple targets, but you might, and there's a reason to, for example, if you have a very small account um, and you want, want to take some money off the table, I guess that's okay. Um, the truth is you'll make more money if you trade a smaller amount and just box in your profits, which I'll show you how to do, and let it run to the logical profits targets. But that being said, if you feel like you have to pull some money off the table, I will show you a methodology that isn't the stupidest thing I've seen and makes some risk-reward sense. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about here. When I first started to do this stuff on the Internet, Median lines and pitchforks had basically disappeared from the trading world. They didn't exist on any charting platform. Nobody talked about them. There was one guy that sold Andrew's course for $5,000, and it was a bad mimeograph copy. And the only reason I got involved was because I, wa I wanted to put him out of business. So I built a website, and I put the Action Reaction course up there free. And then I advertised it. Oh, was he mad. He still pops up every once in a while, but I stamp him out like a bug. Okay? Because he doesn't own the copyrights, neither do I. I don't sell the course. It's there free. Come and get it. I hope you all come and get it. One thing I, I believe in you know, is giving people credit where credit is due. Alan Andrews, Roger Epson, and George Marischal invented this stuff. They should get credit for it. The, the last people that should be making money off it are the, are the people the shysters that are selling this stuff like it's snake oil, which is, you know, how they sell it. So let's take a look at this trade and see what the pitfalls were and how some traders got turned around, and more important, how some traders avoided the pitfalls and found the diamonds in the rough. And I particularly like this because it's nice when I show you a trade where I made money, but it's really nice where I can show you a trade and say, hey, four of my students made money. Now, they may not have traded it exactly like I traded it, but very similar. And this is, this is a very, very difficult, this is a very, very difficult week. So let's take a look. EuroFX is in a very strong uptrend against the dollar. And we all know that. Up until July, the euro was king, right? All the money in the world flew into the euro, period. Some money went to Canada, a little bit went to Australia, New Zealand, but really the money all went to Europe. The problem with it is if you're not a disciplined trader and you don't have high probability trading techniques and entries, it's not as simple as looking at the screen and saying, this is going up, I think I'll get me some. If you've, I'm looking around here, I don't see many 13 and 14 year olds in the audience. Okay, so most of you have been around the block a few times. Okay, I'm 50. I've been, I traded through the Hunt silver deb, uh, debacle. I traded through the OPEC uh, oil crisis. I traded through numerous stock market crashes. I've intervened for, I was, I've been the largest intervener for the Fed in several markets over many years. Um, uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on. However, one thing that always happens, China gets hot, what does everybody do? The public. They run out and they buy Chinese stocks. They don't, they don't think about what, you know, well, they're up 40%, where am I going to get out? The only thing they can think about is they got to get some. It's the same thing with the euro. The euro's in an uptrend. A group of people have to have euros. They don't care how they get them. They just have to have it. 
It's going up. I got to get it. It's going to go up forever. If I don't get it now, I'll never get it. That's what that's what happens. Look at this chart. Now I'm going to switch from bars to candlestick to show price action in a clearer style. Red is down bar. It means it closed on its low. Black means it closed higher on the yes sir. These are 240 minute. And if you don't know, the reason why hedge fund guys, large currency traders trade off of 240 minute, uh, or at least look at them, is this. Morning session in New York, after, afternoon session in New York, that's two 240 minute bars. Morning session in Tokyo, afternoon session in Tokyo, that's two 240 minute bars. Morning session in London, afternoon session. So it breaks the day up into what happened in the morning, what happened in the afternoon. Then we tend to look at 20 minute charts. When I trade futures, I, I, I tra I'll, I'll look at non-time based bars. I'll look at eight tick range bars and that's a whole different story which, that we can talk about afterwards if you want to ask questions. But when, when we look at time based things, I tend to look at two, two frequencies, 240 minute and 20 minute. Okay? This is basically, again, that's this, zoomed in a little bit and turned into candlesticks, just so you can see which bars closed up and which bars closed down. No other reason. Okay? Now let me show you what happens using candlestick bars. When the majority of the market gets caught with the same directional position, and most are not using adequate stop loss or stop profit orders in their trading. Ow. Can we all see how wide that is? That's almost 300 points. Now if I, if I put on a 20 minute chart, I don't have one to show you, but if I actually put it in, it's, it looks exactly the same. It's straight down. There's no pullback. Everybody got caught one way. The door was small. And you had to stand in line to get out. You have to use stops. Where should your stop be? Well, in this case, at least here, you got to, I mean, at this point, you have to be gone. You have to be gone. Period. You can always get back in. Okay, you couldn't stomach this one? How about here? I mean, at some point, enough's enough. But you can't stand there and look at the screen and say, well, it'll come back. Because that's when your capital's gone. And I'll tell you, I probably had about 1,500 trader, professional traders work for me over the years at institutions. And probably at least 20 of the best traders I've had, I've had to fire because they froze. And you can't tell who's going to freeze and who's not going to freeze. They just get themselves in a situation where they can't take the loss. And as a manager, you, you have to know at that point, you have to A, intervene, and B, they're damaged goods at that point. They have a character flaw. And it's almost, I, I, don't, I, can't, I, I can't think of one of them. They, I, I, can, I think of a few of them that are still in the trading community, but most of them actually are order takers. They're brokers, if you will. Um, it, it's, it's irreparable at some point. The damage is just not repairable. So you have to use stops, and stops take that away. You no longer have to look at it and say, oh my God, what am I going to do? It'll come back. You don't have to think about it. You're out of the market now. Now get up, walk away, clear your head. If you can't clear your head, stay away from the market for a while. Then come back later on. You can always trade again. If you don't have stops in, you may blow your whole account. Price made a marginal new high, which you can see up here, for the move, and then simply plumping it. 
And although some traders were probably working stop profit orders, most traders got caught holding long euro positions against the U.S. dollar that quickly lost quite a bit of value. We're going to start out and I'm going to do just a very quick run through of the tools that I use in 99.99% of my trading, just so that we're on the same page. And then we're going to look at a couple of interesting trades. And then we'll answer questions until people have had enough. Raise your hand if you know what a median line is or a pitchfork. Half-ish. Okay, it's good. Um, I'm lucky enough to have studied under Dr. Andrews, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, I was very young at the time and uh, spent a lot of, a lot of time uh, over a long period of time down in South Miami. My brother lived in Hialeah. They developed this in the 1920s. Dr. Andrews made 40, uh, excuse me, $55 million for himself in the first 18 months of the stock crash. He made $450 million for the Kennedys, for Joseph Kennedy, which was his big client. Um, his partner, Roger Babson, sorry? Alan Andrews, A-L-A-N. If you go to my website, believe me, there's, you can see his original course free. It's all there free. It's pages and pages and pages of stuff. Roger Babson, uh, introduced him to the concept of action reaction, Sir Isaac Newton, which is where this all comes from. Uh, he traded uh, alongside of him, made a similar amount of money, and then founded Babson College for his three daughters because he didn't believe, uh, interesting guy ran for president in 1940, he didn't believe there were any universities, Harvard, Princeton, those places were all bastions of terrible people. So he founded Babson College for girls only, um, and then sent his three daughters there. Now, of course, it's a university and it's a co-ed. Um, but you can go there, you can see Sir Isaac Newton's house, you can see the Gravitation Institute, um, you can see all of Isaac Newton's work. It's a very fascinating place, um, and he's done a great job of archiving stuff. Uh, I'm lucky enough to own all of, uh, all of Babson's papers from the period, all of Andrew's work, and all of Marischal, who's the third person involved here. Uh, and between the University of Chicago and Stanford, we're now uh, having all this stuff acid treated. We're at about 600 pages, 600, excuse me, 600,000 pages, plus some manuscripts. And then what we're going to do is we're going to digitalize it and put it on both websites at both universities. We just announced the Milton Friedman Institute of the University of Chicago. And uh, we'll be taking uh, George Marischal's hand charts, and they'll be put up as art, which will be fascinating, from that period. So you'll be able to see all the stuff that went on behind the scenes with four presidents during that whole period from these guys that really moved the world. I mean, they, they pretty much brought J.P. Morgan to his knees trading using this methodology. So that's where it comes from. It came from trading stocks, but you can use it on anything. Let's take a look at the basics of a trade entry setup. And you'll see through my eyes what I look for. Then we'll look at two other traders trading the same basic setup. And they're going to be taking off positions in multiple areas. And we'll see if it makes any sense or if, it, or if it's, I sh this thing should be called bread and butter, bread comes in, bull. Anyway. So, my primary tool as an indicator is a leading indicator. It's called a pitchfork or a median line. And you can see here, we take alternating pivots, a low, a high, and a low, and we'll draw on a pitchfork. But before I draw this one in, I need to have a reason. So let's take a look. We're looking for a change in behavior, and let's look at the behavior pattern of the market here. here we come up and then we start to make lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, all the way down here. We consolidate, make this one low, then out of the blue, for the look at this, for the all this all this way down, the very first time we start to take out a swing high. That's a change in behavior. That doesn't mean you have to get long there, but it does. That's what the bell should go off and say, hey, maybe something has changed here. Maybe the rules of the game have changed. Maybe the market has changed its mind. You don't know, but you want to pay attention now. That's what makes you pay attention. So for me, that's when I go, I wonder if I can draw an upsloping median line because I only buy against upsloping lines and sell against downsloping lines. Why? Anybody know? The trend is your friend. You get 10% statistically for trading with the trend, if you don't know that. So I take that 10% edge every time. You can sell against upsloping lines, but the problem is the resistance keeps going up, so it's called getting collared. Pretty soon you're underwater. There's no point in it. 
Find, you know, if you want to sell, find a downsloping line. If you want to buy, find an upsloping line. If you can't find an upsloping line, I guess you shouldn't be buying. And I'll tell you right now, if you're charting the Dow, there are days lately when it's pretty darn hard to draw any upsloping line. So if you can't draw it, just don't trade that side. If you can't stand being short, just be out of the market. So when I first see this change in behavior right here, when we took out this high, I now draw in from A, B, C, an alternating set of pivots, a median line, okay? And the median line is a line of force, and it's going to tell me the price is going to oscillate around this median line. It'll run out of upside directional energy at the upper median line parallel. It'll tend to run out of downside directional energy at the lower median line parallel. Now, the pitchfork's great. It's a bit wide, but the most important thing is we're not ready to trade yet because we're missing one thing, which is we don't have a high probability or even a low probability trade entry setup. One thing you need before you trade is you need to find a pitch you can hit, if you will, or you need to find a setup that you see over and over and know the statistics on it. You don't want to just look at a chart and say, I think I'm going to go long. That's going to, in the long run, you're going to lose money. It doesn't have to be this methodology, but whatever methodology you use, you need to find setups that you can see on a repeatable basis, and then you can do the statistics on it so that you know what the probabilities are. Then you need to couple that with money management. You need to only take trades that have an acceptable size stop loss for you. And that's what we're going to show here. If the trade, if the stop on the trade is too large, too large for you, just pass. You can Downsize, you know, take half the position or a third of the position and take a wider stop. But in general, the right thing to do if the stop is too big is just to move on. Look for another trade. Or wait. Maybe you'll get an entry if you wait three or four bars. Okay? Now, when I first put this in, if you can see, this median line has not been tested, if you will. Price has never tested it since I drew it. We're just starting to head up. Now price comes up. And you can see it stopped right where it's supposed to, at the median line. It, it's acting as the first level of resistance, if you will. Comes back down, does a little dance, touches it again. It's nudging. It's trying to get up into that upper quadrant. Can't do it. Comes back down. Now, if you take a look, we start to take out this mini swing high. In my mind, I go, OK. It seems to be attracted to this median line. What if this is a low, a significant low? Now, I might be completely full of it. I may be erasing this line in two bars. But the idea is, as price unfolds in front of you, you want to always be saying, whenever you see a swing high getting taken out or a swing low being taken out, in the back of your mind, you should be saying, is this meaningful, first of all? Second of all, well, if it is, what can I do with it? Well, in this case, I could have done a couple things. I could have drawn an upsloping median line from here, 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 but it's so steep, I don't want to trade off of that. We're going we're gonna to swim right out of it real quick. It's going to be meaningless. So the only other thing I can do is I can wonder if this is a significant low, maybe it'll oscillate or vibrate, if you will, at the same frequency as the median line and run between these two. Now, as I said, I might be completely wrong in two bars, but sometimes you'll see the market hug these on one side or the other, and if they're wide enough, they are tradable. And as I said in the beginning, this is a very wide median line. We were talking about more than two big figures or two handles in the Japanese yen. So that's plenty of room to trade. So now I watch it unfold. I still have no idea what I'm going to do yet. I'm looking for a clue that this is meaningful. Now I get three touches up here. You can see it continually gets dragged up to the median line, but is unable to go above. When I get the second touch down here, and price takes out some highs, I think, uh, you know, I think I got something here. And we'll talk, we'll talk about this at the very end. I'm going to show you a slide. I call this a rolling chop. And the reason I call it is price just rolls along here, and the breakout traders get chopped because they take out this high, they get long. And this is them puking down here. Then they get short when it takes out the prior low, and they get, now they're caught short. They get chopped on the downside. Then they get chopped on the upside, and they get chopped on the downside. That's what keeps price in this range. So if you can identify it and it's wide enough, you can trade it. 
Well, every trader wants to know what it's going to take to be a success, and do successful traders share certain personality traits or just traits in general? Our guest today is Tim Morich, who's trained and, and seen many, many traders over the years. Tim, thanks for being here. My pleasure. All right, so do good traders have things in common that we can point to and say, I'm going to get that trade if I'm going to be successful in the markets? Absolutely. Uh, the be I know certainly the, what I think are the best traders in the world. Um, most of them are not common uh, names. Um, they like to be quiet. They're trading a large amounts of money. They don't want to be followed. But that being said, they do share common traits, which and the, the biggest thing is um, they have set rules. They know themselves intimately. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. They never break their rules when they do. They take a time out, clear their head, get back to business. Um, this trading is a business. It's not fun time. You know, when things are going well, you, you can't be doing the happy dance. It's, you know, it's all about, you know, adhering to the rules and, uh, and never breaking them. And I've seen uh, some traders uh, that, that would have worked for me, um, you know, when I, when, I, when I ran stuff at institutions, ran large trading desks. Um, you'd see guys lose their edge and lose their ability to manage themselves and completely fall apart and never, and never catch it again. Do successful traders focus on one market and one strategy? Are they able to trade a lot of different markets at one time? It depends on the trader. I like to, you know, I'm, getting, I'm 53, I'm not that old, but I, you know, I, the older I get, the more simple I get. I, I, I tend to trade less markets. At one point, I probably traded 10 or 15 markets. Um, I portfolio trade 27 markets, but those trades can go 13, 14 months at a time, so there's not much attention to be paid. At the end of the day, you just check your stop loss and, and your, or your stop profit and put in your orders and make sure everything's okay. But in terms of intraday, I think you can probably pay attention to three or four things successfully. You know, the people that think that they can watch 20 things at once are kidding themselves. And you hear that every successful trader has an edge in some way. They don't take a trade unless they have an edge in that trade. Yes. What is that edge for, for most of these traders? For most of them, it's two things. It's the, that they, they have a solid money management uh, stop. They have an area that they can lean on. Um, you know, I was lucky enough early on uh, to, to be mentored by another great gentleman, Amos Hosteller and uh, passed away, unfortunately, a long time ago, but probably the, the best person I know in money management. And uh, one of the things he taught us is, you know, and when I was at Commodities Corporation, when you first went there, if you were managing a large amount of money, you had to mentor people. And I was one of the regional mentors in the Midwest. And you'd go in his office and he would play called, what he called a hat game. And he would take two hats and he'd pass them, there'd be 10 of us, and he'd put a $1,000 bill on the table. Only time I've ever seen a $1,000 bill. And he'd pass the two hats, one, one each way, and you'd take out a slip. And one would be a commodity, and the other would be whether you're long or short. And this would be before the open. He'd say, okay, now you know your position. And come see me at the end of the day. At the end of the day, one of you gets $1,000, whoever makes the most money. You get one trade. End of discussion. And the idea was not to give $1,000 away. The idea was that he wanted his mentors to understand how important money management was. That you could take a random position, and if you analyze the market correctly and use good money management, you can make money. Now, sometimes the best trade was just to exit right at the opening. But, you know, that's a lesson you have to learn. The other thing that they have, and I think it's just become more and more, I've seen it become more and more important um, as I've taught people, is risk-reward. How much are you risking potentially when you put on the trade? And then afterwards, doing the analysis and say, how much did I actually make versus how much did I risk? And if the two are greatly different, your targets are probably unrealistic. So I would say great traders do two things. They're great at money management, and they always start out with good risk-reward. I don't take anything less than three to one now. I've upped myself from two to one. Uh, the best trader I know in the world, um, he's at about five to one. But those are longer-term trades. Right. Tim, thanks for your time. My pleasure. You're watching the MoneyShow.com video network. This is how I would enter. We've got all these touches. Here's another touch at the media line. Price comes off this touch, and you can see it closed on its high, which is a sign of strength, after touching this sliding parallel. Now it's taking out highs. What's it do? It goes right to the median line and, once again, fails utterly. But remember, there's plenty of guys out there that got long up here because it was a new high, which is why they got long here and why they got long here. And you can see each time they got long, they ran the market ran their stops, which is why we went down here. That's why it's called a rolling chop. They're just getting chopped up. You just want to say no. Don't, 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 don't trade it backwards like that. That's just a bad idea. Okay, so what I want to do, I like this test. I especially like it. You, it's hard, probably hard for you to see, but this bar 
comes down and, touch it, and tests this same sliding parallel that held down here, down here, and it closes on its high, which is a sign of strength. It closes with what I call good separation, which means it closes near the high of the bar. That tells me that there are buyers down there in control of this market. If it comes back down and tests a sliding parallel, I want to get long. But I've got to check the stop. Can I afford the stop? The way I look at stops is this way. I have a mental checkbook in front of me. When I want to take the trade, I go, okay, how big a stop is this? And what, how much is it going to cost me per contract? And I start to write out the check in my mind. And if, if, if it doesn't meet my requirements, if it's too big a check, I, I literally go, well, that's, that's too much. Never mind. I, I'm throwing this trade away. I'll find an, I'll just wait. Uh, I call it buying another bar or looking, just look for another setup if you have to go to a different market. But if the check is too big, you should be thinking about that all the time. You want to risk enough that you can make money, but you never, ever, ever want to risk so much that you, A, are crippled emotionally, and B, go, obviously go tap. You never want to lose your, your bankroll because once you lose your capital, you're out of the game. You know the Bond movie where the guy goes, I'm all in? Anybody you see that? See, you, can't, you can never do that. Even James Bond was stupid when he did it. And, he, and you know the first time he did it, he got tapped. And then, of course, the Americans came to his aid. But that's a different story. You never, there's never ever a situation where you can say, I'm all in, or I'm even 10% in. I'm, there's never, you should never be risking 10% of your account, ever, on anything, period. Because even if you have a royal flush, the other guy might have a royal flush with a better suit. There's just no point. Never take a bet that can make you bankrupt, ever. Or actually, you never want to take a, 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 a bet or place a position that's going to actually put you in danger, even emotionally in danger. And let me tell you, if you lose 10% of your count on a trade, you'll be emotionally crippled. So please, don't do that. Always trade with stops. Put your stops in when you put your entry positions in. Never, ever, ever ever take a trade without taking a stop. If that's all you walk out of here with, that will save you a fortune. Mental stops are useless. If you think you're good enough that you can use mental stops the rest of your life, give me your money and at least somebody will like you when you're bankrupt. <laughs> because you will go bankrupt. And I teach at the Merck, okay, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, hundreds of traders, and I watch guys that don't use stops go bankrupt. Ten, guys that have 10 or 15 million dollars in their account. So believe me, this guy's been trading 25 years. If you don't use stops, real hard stops, there will come a time when you'll freeze and you'll be bankrupt. So please, always use stops. Everybody. Period. There's nobody here or professional traders good enough to not use stops. Save yourself the time and the energy. So I take a look and I say, okay, I want to get in at 102.09. And how did I figure that out? I took a look at where price would come down the next bar or two and test this sliding parallel, and that's 102.09. Where's my stop? I don't use cash-based stops. That means I don't say, I'll risk $150. What I do is, I will not take a trade unless I'm hiding underneath a swing low or a swing high, period. And the reason why is, there'll be limit buyers down here, right here. There'll be limit buyers here. Now, I obviously can't put, afford to put my stop here. But I can afford to put my stop here, so I'm going to risk 9 plus 6 is 15 ticks on this trade. Everybody with me? And I'm going to use this. I'm going to hide underneath this a little bit, which is a volatility cushion, underneath this swing low. And there they should be limit buyers here. If I'm wrong, it'll run through here like, uh, I, don't, I don't know any phrase I can say over the air, but you know what I mean. It'll just plunge right through. People ask me what my losing trades look like. Generally, it's the next bar and instantly I'm out. I'm stopped out. That's okay. That's what stops are for. That means I'm dead wrong. You just reset, look for another trade. But if the stop's small enough, you don't even blink. It doesn't bother you. That's why you should use quality stops, smaller size positions. All right, so now we know how to set up the trade. Now I put up here how do I use multiple targets that make sense? Well, the truth is I never use multiple targets. But some of the people I mentor do, and one of my partners does as well, and some, a lot of guys at the Merck that I've uh, had in seminars do. So I'm going to show you one example that I, hopefully you'll immediately say, this doesn't make sense. And I'll show you another example that has some thought behind it, has some merit. I still wouldn't use multiple targets, but you might, and there's a reason to, 
for example, if you have a very small account um, and you want, want to take some money off the table, I guess that's okay. Um, the truth is you'll make more money if you trade a smaller amount and just box in your profits, which I'll show you how to do, and let it run to the logical profits targets. But that being said, if you feel like you have to pull some money off the table, I will show you a methodology that isn't the stupidest thing I've seen it, and make some risk reward sense. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about here. I thank you all for taking the time to come here and spend uh, an hour or so with me. I'm going to not run long today because I get in trouble from Traders Expo when I run too long. They're trying to get people in and out, and I understand that. Uh, we'll hopefully finish in time to take some questions. Um, what we're going to do today, um, I actually built on Friday, although I did this with one of the gentlemen that I mentor uh, on a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one sessions. And uh, the basic idea is um, I had met with him about four weeks in a row, and he was having trouble in these markets finding any trades. This is not an inexperienced trader. He kept coming to sessions. When I mentor, I'm not trying to teach people to trade how I trade. I'm trying to improve their trading. So I don't go there with my charts and say, here's what I did. Here's what you should do. What I do is they do their homework, then they bring their homework, then we take a look at it. And then we analyze it, and we'll look for flaws. We'll look for good things that they're doing. We'll look for ways to improve. Or we'll, when is the time to move on to new techniques, things like that? How can we improve their money management? When's the time to improve their risk? That types of thing. So for the last four sessions that he'd been coming in, he really didn't have any trades. Not much to talk about. Didn't even really have any setups to look at. And I kept saying, well, what do you, what's the problem? I mean, did you try, how about this? Why don't you try a different time frame? Came back the next week. I tried this time frame. I tried, you know, well, how about some different, I'll give you, let me give you four more things to look at. Came back, I, you know what, I don't see anything in this market. So obviously he had frozen. And that happens sometimes with traders. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever, anybody ever experienced that where you just, you're looking at a chart and you go, I just don't see anything. Okay, now, four weeks is a long time for that to go on, especially if you experience. But it happens. So the idea was, I said to him, you know what, I, got, I have a free day coming up because I'm about to travel to New York. Let's do this. I'll be, don't tell me in advance because I don't want to cheat. I'll see you at 9 o'clock in the morning online. We do this virtual online. We'll put up my account. We'll put up eSignal. You tell me that day what the commodity is, what time frame it is, and we'll see if we can find a trade. And we'll just trade for three or four hours and see what the hell we can find. If we can't find anything, I'm wrong. But I guarantee you we'll find something. Now, I'm, I'm hoping he's not going to go rough rice or something, but you get what you get, right? And the idea was I, w I went through with him bar by bar so that we could look at it and try and refocus what he's looking at and also what I look at when I trade. And that's what we're going to try and do today. And I'll edit a number of, uh, of points during the day. And a couple of you guys that were in the paid session yesterday have seen this already. That's all right. You'll, still, you'll get something out of it just by repetition. As we go through it bar by, by bar, I'm going to stop and say, okay, what do you guys think? Up, down, sideways? Do you see anything? So please do me a favor and just participate. If you see, if you see nothing, say, hey, I don't see anything. That's okay. Because not every bar tells you something. But there are bars that give you actual information, and that's what we're going to take a look at. And hopefully that will actually spring... Uh, some thoughts about a trade. So let's take a look. Um, that's just my logo. That's not important. Forex risk disclaimer. Look, there's no holy grail. This is not the holy grail. I don't have the holy grail, and nobody has the holy grail. Don't go looking for it. The way to make money is to find repeatable trade setups that work over and over. Use good money management. Use good risk reward. Find your weaknesses. Stay away from them. Find your strengths. Play to them. Don't ever trade. This is my experience. It may not be your experience. Your trading skills may differ from yours. Yours may differ from mine. The last thing I want to say about foreign exchange specifically, because that's the market we're going to talk about today, is some of the smaller shops will allow you to trade what are called micro contracts, and they'll let you use up to 500 to 1 leverage. Please don't do that. You'll just be blowing your feet off. And you may not understand this. Let's say you have a $10,000 account. If you overuse leverage, they may call you up and say, your $10,000 is gone, and you owe us a check for $6,000. Nobody wants to be in that position. So use leverage very carefully, folks. Just because they say you can put $500 in their account and you can trade $10,000, please stop. Think carefully. Slow down. If you're going to use these micro-contracts, trade small so that the loss is $10. That's the idea. Then you can learn and still have this feel that you've got money on the trade. And it's, you don't want to make a million dollars. You just don't want to lose a lot. That's the whole idea of the micro contracts. 
Then once you learn, then you can change your size, okay? But be careful with leverage, please. These people will let you kill yourself. Don't do it. Here we go. I show up at 9 o'clock in the morning. He wants to trade the Canadian dollar. Cash FX. Canadian dollar against the U.S. dollar. Anybody here trade cash FX? Or how about currency futures? Okay. They're not particularly different than trading stocks or stock indexes. They move very similarly. This is a daily chart. Now you can see on the daily, the nice thing about the daily is that they're fairly clean. There aren't that many pivots. The bad thing about the dailies are there aren't that many pivots. So you don't get that many setups. You might go weeks without a setup. If you get a setup, then you might get a nice big move. But remember, the longer the time frame, the larger the volatility, the bigger the stop. Right? 240 minute. This is one of the things he was looking at. He wasn't looking at dailies. He was looking at 240s. More pivots, still fairly large stops. It takes four hours for each bar to form. So I said to him, what exactly do you want to trade today? Out of the blue, he said to me, I want to trade five-minute Canadian dollar bars. Now, in, in my wildest dreams, I would never have thought that he would have said five-minute Canadian dollar bars, but okay, I told him, you know, whatever you want, that works for me. So let's take a look. Just so you know, if I was trading Canada, I would either be trading 20-minute bars or 240-minute bars, or I'd be trading a non-time-based bar, something like 13 pips or ticks per bar in a range which is equivalent to about 15 or 20 minutes. This is a little fast for me, but that's fine. If you want to generate some trades, this should generate some trades. It may also generate a lot of noise. That's why I wouldn't go down to five minutes, but that's what he wanted to do. That's fine for me. So it's 9 o'clock in the morning, and we're going at it. What are we going to take? Look at this. This is, looks pretty orderly. What are you going to do with this? Come on in. It's a little snaky-looking thingy. I don't know. Do you see anything special? This looks kind of like a mess to me. So let's, let's see if we can make some sense of it. So the first idea that I always do with people that have trouble reading the market, whether they have a block or whether they're just bad at reading the market. Sometimes when I start to work with people, they're not very good at identifying swing highs and swing lows and whether or not a market is trending up or trending down or congesting. So to some of you, that may seem obvious, but to a lot of people, they have no idea. They buy or sell because something's going up, and that's the end of the thought process. But they don't know where swing high is, or swing low, whether we're making higher highs and higher lows. And it's important for you to identify that just on the chart. And one easy way to do it is this way. Connect the highs, connect the lows. Now in this area, you've got lower highs and higher lows. That means you're congesting, not going anywhere. When that pattern breaks, you start to make higher highs and higher lows, okay, you're in a nice little uptrend. Once again, that pattern breaks, you get a nice pullback. That's a lower highs, lower lows, a small pullback. Uh, you get a counter trend rally, or this may be the rent. It's hard to tell where the, ra where the trend is at this point. You're really kind of congesting. And even here, when we go lower, it doesn't really go anywhere, if you can see, but we've got lower highs and lower lows, so it is in a small downtrend. Now, when you start to take out highs and make higher lows, the uptrend begins here in earnest. So this whole area is a nice uptrend. And on this five-minute period, this would have been nice to catch, although we aren't trading yet. We're just identifying the market at this point. We got a tiny pullback here, and then the uptrend continues. And all I did to identify this is connect highs and lows. So if you get lost, if you look at a market that you haven't been watching and you go, you know what, I'm not sure how, how to read this, take five minutes and just connect the highs and lows, and you got the map right in front of you. Then go, okay, now where am I at? And what would it take if, let's say at the end here, we're in higher highs and higher lows, which is an uptrend. What would it take to turn this into a downtrend? Well, it would take you taking out this prior low, look, right here and then making a lower high and taking out this low and making a lower low, then you'd have a change in behavior. And you go, hey, I got, that, I got something going here. Is it something I want to trade off of? So those are the kind of things we're going to look for, amongst other things. But this is the big picture kind of thing. If you're lost, start here. All right? All I did, I went to the end here where we were in this trend, and I zoomed in. I said, okay, let's zoom in. All right, let me put a box around here because I'm trying to get him to focus in. I want to keep drawing him into the action. Because obviously, for four weeks, he's sitting back, and the action is just streaming right by him, and he's not interacting at all. So I'm trying to just drag him right into the bars. Cool. I want him to get right into the war. Get your hands dirty, and let's go. It's not his money. Anyway, it's my account. So let's take a look. So I drag him right in. I take this box. Let's blow that up. That's this box right here. So this blown up is this. So now we're down to looking almost bar by bar action. 
And I want him to do that. I want, to take, I want him to look at the high and the low and the close and how the close is relative to the high and the low. What's going on here? Do any of you do this type of thing? Raise your hand if you look at bars that closely. Okay, some of you do. That's good. Please turn your phones off or put them on vibrate and make yourself happy. Okay. So we're in this strong uptrend. I turned mine off, by the way. Um, I mean, we're in this strong uptrend. Now we take out this high, and you can see the wide range bar closes on its high. That's good. That's a sign of strength. That means this uptrend, at least at the moment, is still intact, right? Nothing's changed. Now there's no way for me to get in here. What am I going to do? Buy at the high? I got no stop. So at this point, I can just watch. But I note with interest that we had this wide range bar higher, and we close on our high. So that's a sign of strength. What are we going to get next? What do we get? Anybody think? What do you think we got? Higher bar, higher, higher high, or are we going to go lower? Higher, raise your hand. Anybody? Lower. Come on, you got to participate now, or am I asking you to leave? Lower? Uh, don't give me dojos, just higher and lower. Now we got an inside bar? Give me your inside bar. How many guys? All right, so slightly lower, a couple inside bars. All right, here we go. We get a slightly higher high, and we close lower. Alternating closes. How many people look at alternating closes? Probably not too many people. You should pay attention, especially if they're at an extreme like that. If you make a new high, but then you get an alternating closes. If you start to get a series of alternating closes, three, four, five, generally a sign that we might have a rounding top or rounding bottom forming. Doesn't mean it's formed. You still need to change the behavior, but that's an also, also often a very good sign that something's going on. So pay attention to these alternating closes. So we make this new high. We get a lower close in the lower third of the bar. You got nothing to do yet, but you should be scratching your head saying, oh, that's pretty interesting. If you're not, you're not paying attention. Now we get double tops. Always a good sign. Everybody loves double, double tops, double bottoms, right? Easy to look at, easy to spot. People always put orders at them to buy or sell. They want to buy above them if it breaks below. They want to sell right in front of them and then put their stops above them. But at least it's a, it's a marker on the chart that almost everybody in this room has seen before in whatever you trade, unless you don't trade. That's one of the most obvious things that anybody that looks at charts, looks at double bottoms, triple bottoms, double tops, triple tops, okay? So now we've got double tops, but uh, what else do we have? Three alternating closes. Does it mean anything? Not yet, but we've got alternating closes continuing to build. Let's see what we get. Now we get a wide, wide range bar. I didn't ask you because no one's going to guess this one. Wide range bar, make a new high, then we make a huge new low, close on our low. And we have a Anybody? It was not like Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Alternating close, alternating close. One, two, three, four alternating closes. And I note with interest that this wide range bar encompasses the prior three bars. In other words, it's controlling all the prior action. You can actually forget that prior action. This bar is now in control of that action. Now look, look at the highs. We've got one new high, then double tops, which are new highs. Now this, which is new highs. So we're making new highs. But if you think about it, look at the closes, we're really not making any progress up here. It's almost like we're making new highs, but we're kind of congesting in the center here. We're trying to go higher, but we're really not going higher, are we, in a lot of ways? It's like the car's going around the, you've been in one of those taxi rides where you go 12 blocks and you actually could have walked, it was only a half a block. So what's going on here? Now we get a second bar. This one is not alternating closes. We get a new lower low. It takes out double bottoms and leaves new double bottoms down here. So we've got a quandary here. We've got these nice highs going on in here. Now we've got double bottoms, which should be support down here. <coughs> we're still closing right in this whole congestive area, although now we're down at the low end of it. Next time to vote. Higher? Raise your hand if you say higher. Lower? Inside. Lower wins, basically. Most people are too asleep, apparently. Okay. Everybody wins. Outside bar. We make a new low. We break through the double bottoms. But it wasn't particularly meaningful because after we did that, we then took out the high of the prior bar. But look where we closed. Right back in the center of the action. What's it telling you? It's trying to make a decision, but it hasn't made one. It isn't time to make a trade yet. Let's take a look at the basics of a trade entry setup. And you'll see through my eyes what I look for. 
Then we'll look at two other traders trading the same basic setup. And they're going to be taking off positions in multiple areas. And we'll see if it makes any sense or if it's, or if it's I sh this thing should be called bread and butter, breadcrumbs and bull. Anyway. So my primary tool as an indicator is a leading indicator. It's called a pitchfork or a median line. And you can see here, we take alternating pivots, a low, a high, and a low, and we'll draw in a pitchfork. But before I draw this one in, I need to have a reason. So let's take a look. We're looking for a change in behavior, and let's look at the behavior pattern of the market here. Here, we come up and then we start to make lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, all the way down here. We consolidate, make this one low, then out of the blue, for the, look at this, for the, all, this, all this way down, the very first time we start to take out a swing high. That's a change in behavior. That doesn't mean you have to get long there, but it does, that's what the bell should go off and say, hey, maybe something has changed here. Maybe the rules of the game have changed. Maybe the market has changed its mind. You don't know, but you want to pay attention now. That's what makes you pay attention. So for me, that's when I go, I wonder if I can draw an upsloping median line because I only buy against upsloping lines and sell against downsloping lines. Why? Anybody know? The trend is your friend, you get 10% statistically for trading with the trend, if you don't know that. So I take that 10% edge every time. You can sell against upsloping lines, but the problem is the resistance keeps going up, so it's called getting collared. Pretty soon you're underwater. There's no point in it. Find, you know, if you want to sell, find a downsloping line. If you want to buy, find an upsloping line. If you can't find an upsloping line, I guess you shouldn't be buying. And I'll tell you right now, if you're charting the Dow, there are days lately when it's pretty darn hard to draw any upsloping line. So if you can't draw it, just don't trade that side. If you can't stand being short, just be out of the market. So when I first see this change in behavior right here, when we took out this high, I now draw in from A, B, C, an alternating set of pivots, a median line, okay? And the median line is a line of force, and it's going to tell me that price is going to oscillate around this median line. It'll run out of upside directional energy at the upper median line parallel. It'll tend to run out of downside directional energy at the lower median line parallel. Now, the pitchfork's great. It's a bit wide, but the most important thing is we're not ready to trade yet because we're missing one thing, which is we don't have a high probability or even a low probability trade entry setup. One thing you need before you trade is you need to find a pitch you can hit, if you will, or you need to find a setup that you see over and over and know the statistics on it. You don't want to just look at a chart and say, I think I'm going to go long. That's going to, in the long run, you're going to lose money. It doesn't have to be this methodology, but whatever methodology you use, you need to find setups that you can see on a repeatable basis, and then you can do the statistics on it so that you know what the probabilities are. Then you need to couple that with money management. You need to only take trades that have an acceptable size stop loss for you. And that's what we're going to show here. If the trade, if the stop on the trade is too large, too large for you, just pass. You can Downsize, you know, take half the position or a third of the position and take a wider stop. But in general, the right thing to do if the stop is too big is just to move on. Look for another trade. Or wait. Maybe you'll get an entry if you wait three or four bars. Okay? Now, when I first put this in, if you can see, this median line has not been tested, if you will. Price has never tested it since I drew it. We're just starting to head up. Now price comes up. And you can see it stopped right where it's supposed to, at the median line. It, it's acting as the first level of resistance, if you will. Comes back down, does a little dance, touches it again. It's nudging. It's trying to get up into that upper quadrant. Can't do it. Comes back down. Now, if you take a look, we start to take out this mini swing high. In my mind, I go, OK, it seems to be attracted to this median line. What if this is a low, a significant low? Now, I might be completely full of it. I may be erasing this line in two bars. But the idea is, 
as price unfolds in front of you, you want to always be saying, whenever you see a swing high getting taken out or a swing low being taken out, in the back of your mind, you should be saying, is this meaningful, first of all? Second of all, well, if it is, what can I do with it? Well, in this case, I could have done a couple things. I could have drawn an upsloping median line from here, 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 but it's so steep, I don't want to trade off of that. We're going we're gonna to swim right out of it real quick. It's going to be meaningless. So the only other thing I can do is I can wonder if this is a significant low, maybe it'll oscillate or vibrate, if you will, at the same frequency as the median line and run between these two. Now, as I said, I might be completely wrong in two bars, but sometimes you'll see the market hug these on one side or the other, and if they're wide enough, they are tradable. And as I said in the beginning, this is a very wide median line. We were talking about more than two big figures or two handles in the Japanese yen. So that's plenty of room to trade. So now I watch it unfold. I still have no idea what I'm going to do yet. I'm looking for a clue that this is meaningful. Now I get three touches up here. You can see it continually gets dragged up to the median line, but is unable to go above. When I get the second touch down here, and price takes out some highs, I think, uh, you know, I think I got something here. And we'll talk, we'll talk about this at the very end, I'm going to show you a slide. I call this a rolling chop, and the reason I call it is price just rolls along here, and the breakout traders get chopped because they take out this high, they get long, and this is them puking down here. Then they get short when it takes out the prior low, and they get, now they're caught short. They get chopped on the downside, then they get chopped on the upside, and they get chopped on the downside. That's what keeps price in this range. So if you can identify it and it's wide enough, you can trade it. We've got this wide range bar that closes in the middle. He's absolutely right. It's not that nothing's going on. It's that people that get long at bad, at bad highs are getting flushed out. People that are getting short on the bad lows are getting flushed out. And where do we end up? Right back in the middle with no positions. Right? But that ain't going to go on forever. All right, so now look at this wide range bar. Before I told you we had this wide range bar and encompassed three bars, this wide range bar covers the last 11. So it's a whole hour's worth of trading. We haven't, done, we haven't gone anywhere. We've, people have gotten excited and got long, got blown out, got excited, got short, blown out, and we're right back in the middle of the range for a whole hour. Nobody's, believe me, there's nobody happy here other than the market makers, and we don't want to pay them. No offense to any of the market makers out there. Here we go. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a few bars just to save you some pain in the you-know-what. We get this nice downtrend. Look at it. It's beautiful. Finally, the darn thing moves. We get lower highs, lower lows. It's absolutely gorgeous. Isn't that what you're looking for? Okay, here we go. Next bar. Lower. Higher. Jeez. Wide range bar shoots out of the hole. Everybody that was in this and jumped in and finally found their way in, in one bar it took out every single high. Every single high. They're all washed out. Excuse me? Yeah, I've got, well, I've got different pivots, absolutely, yes. Um, so, in a, in a certain sense, that one bar wiped out all that work. For all those people that got short, they finally found a way in. They finally saw, they thought they saw the light. They saw the light, all right. <laughs> all right, let's see what we happen. And what do you think happens from here? Higher or lower? Lower? Higher? Yeah, give me lower. Higher? That's 50-50, okay. Anybody say the day's over? No, okay. We, can, we consolidate. We go into an energy coil, price is tired from making this run down and now this wide range higher. Now everybody's going, the people that got short said, you know, geez, I better take a walk around the block or I better go get a drink or whatever. The market makers are counting their money. The market's resting. Now if you've been looking at a screen for an hour and a half and you haven't in a trade or you made a trade, and you're out, it's a great time to go get something, to drink. and I don't mean a vodka, go get some, you know, a green tea or some water or something, take a walk outside for five minutes. And there's a couple guys here in mentoring, so one thing I tell them, if you're in the screen for an hour, hour and a half, and you haven't made a trade, get up and stretch your legs, get away for a little bit, clear your eyes, because otherwise your eyes start to glaze over, you start to hunch over, and you're only working at half speed. So, you know, try and always be full and ready to go when things are going on. So if the market's congesting, it's telling you it's restoring its energy, time for you to restore your energy. If you don't feel well, don't trade today. 
There's always a market tomorrow. If you need a break, take your five or ten minute break. Be good to yourself because you'll trade better, okay? All right, so the market's restored. We're restored. Let's see what we get. Higher or lower out of here? Higher? Lower? 50-50, uh, okay. Makes sense. We go higher. Price continues to make higher highs. Now take a look at them. We break out with a wide range hard high, closes basically on its high in its upper third. Then we make a higher high but close on its low. We make another higher high, closes on its high. What do we have? Alternating closes, which tells us should be a little bit worried about this rally. Ready? Higher or lower? Higher first. Lower? Lower wins hands down. Ready? Well, here we go. Up, down, up again. Where are we going? I mean, you guys just answer what you think. The, the problem is I built this on Friday, so I, ha I, I really actually am going side by side going, what the heck did I build? Let's pull back. If you wanted to know what it looked like, this is the whole day that we've seen now so far. Now you can see that sell off. Now this is that rally up, and these are these last three highs that have alternated any closes. So if you want to pull back and see the big picture, this is what it looks like, okay? <laughs> Does that help anybody? Now I'm going to ask you again, higher or lower? Higher, lower, 50-50, okay. What's the most probable path of price long term? Higher, lower, how about this? Are we going to significant new highs or significant new lows? Significant new highs, significant new lows, staying in the range. Okay, so we've got a couple people looking for new lows, a lot more people looking for new highs, and about an equal amount of number saying going to stay in the range. Anybody disagree with that? Okay. This is what I notice. We've got this topping pattern over here. And we had, I think this is a rounding top. If you take a look at the closes, we kept bouncing up here, and even though we made a series of new highs, we can never close up there. We don't see any signs of strength up here at all. Every time we get up here, the sellers show up out of the woodwork. Now we turn down and we sell off hard. Now the market's working its way back up, but we're starting to get alternating closes again, just like we did here. Now, will it take out this prior high? I'm going to ask you, can you see where price is headed? New highs, new lows. New highs, new lows. Equal. Okay. Okay. Do you, anybody ever do this? Do you draw them on your chart and say, you know, new high would look like this, new low would look like this, what do I think? Anybody do that? I'm it. Okay. You might want to try it. You know, when I'm in a quandary, I draw it in and go, no, I don't think that looks right. Or, yeah, that could happen. Or, what would make that happen? Think ahead. You get paid to think ahead. You get paid a lot to think ahead, believe me. It's kind of, you know, it's like a chess game. The more moves you can actually accurately think ahead, the better off you're going to be. Now, do you want to sell? If you think price is going to this line, let's forget about what it's going to do yet. Let's think about tactics. If you think price is actually going to make it to this test of the prior highs, do you want to sell as price approaches these prior highs? Or if you're in the camp that you think it's going to make new highs, instead, do you want it to break above and then trying to find an area to buy? So who wants to sell at the line as it gets there? Who wants to wait for it to break through and then buy a pullback? Who doesn't want to trade the Canadian dollar? <laughs> so here's the thing. Let's take a closer look. Some traders got short here, the market makers especially. Most of them got their money out when they did this snap back here. But some of them are still short. The people that are still short have got stop loss buy orders up here. If it takes out these highs, they just give me my money, I'm out of here, whatever's left, right? There's going to be people especially the larger traders that say, hey, this looks like a good area for me to get short if I'm going to try and get short. I'll put limit sell orders right here or right before here. If these limit sell orders are big enough, the stop loss buyers aren't going to get hit. If these limit sell orders get hit, not only the orders from these traders are going to get hit, but the new positions are going to have stop loss orders up here, and they're going to get hit, and this thing is going to take off like a rocket. 
Now, if there are enough limit sell orders, what's going to happen? Anybody got a guess? It'll hit their stop and turn back around, right? All right, so let's take a look. Now, here's how I think about my own trades, and I have this on my computer. Guys in mentoring have heard me say this before. Confident, cocky, lazy, and dead. This is the progression of being in good, good shape. If you want this, I'll email it to you. Um, it, this is from a book by the name of Tad Williams. He's a science fiction writer. It's a great book, but it has nothing to do with trading, but it's a great, uh, it's a great analogy. When you're in the peak of what you're doing, planning and thoughtfulness are completely in control. You're not thinking about, I've got to trade, I must trade, if I don't trade, I'll die. Instead, you're thinking about, hmm, what do I want to do? What am I looking for? How do I want to do it? And you've got it all planned out, and you wait for the opportune moment. And when you're on the top of your game, that's where you want to be. Now, when you get a, come on in, darling. When you, when you get a little bit of success under your belt, sometimes you move over to the cocky period, and that's okay. This is fine. And this is kind of a, uh, an area where you're still planning and having some good thoughtfulness, but also you're saying, you know, when's the next trade coming here? Because I, I just had three or four good trades. I'd like some more. And most people actually that are good traders don't operate over here on the left. They tend to operate over here. They're looking for more trades. They're a little more aggressive. If they have some success, they tend to cut a few corners, but not enough that they do a lot of damage to their trading. So either one of these is okay. The farther you are to the left, the higher your success rate is going to be, but your number of trades are going to go down as well because you're going to be more choosy about which trades you're going to take. When you start to bleed over in this area called lazy, planning and thoughtfulness is getting less and less interesting to you, and you're interested in, you know, I've only made four trades today. I'd really like to make six or seven. Anybody ever find themselves in that position? Come on, be honest. Come on, just give me a couple more. It's only 2 o'clock. Come on, give me a couple more trades, right? Okay, you're in, a, you're in a slump, and you know where you're going if you're not careful? What's this word? Dead. What's it, what this is, there is no planning and thoughtfulness. This is only, it's going down, let me get short. It's going up, wait, let me get long. And that, these are the people that the market makers just chase in and out of the market all day long until their accounts go to, um, not, the NFA says, and I've done these statistics with them on sealed accounts, the average retail trader that opens an account with $10,000 in six months closes their account with nothing in it. I'm here with Tim Morge. He's a frequent contributor to MoneyShow.com and the Tips for Traders. Tim, thanks for joining us. Hey, Tim, how are you? Good, thanks. Now, you talked in uh, previous interviews we've done about Dow being near 7,000, and looks like we're headed that direction. Do you, what, you still feel confident in that number? Uh, people were asking me that when the Dow was bouncing and going back up to 9,000, said, you want to abandon your, uh, in fact, some of my friends that are chartists sent me charts and said, are you sure you don't want to, re we've got triple bottoms down there at 8,900, 8, don't you want to maybe pull back from that prediction? And I said, my chart says uh, 7,200, and if that gives, the real target's 5,700, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and stick with that. Now, are you... As a pure chart of seeing that, or do you see that you then take the news into account as well and say this, the combined with the chart looks like this number? It is pure. This is the pure, I'm just telling you the pure charting. Now, in terms of the economics of the situation, um, the longer they try and hold this up by doing all these goofy deals, the worse it's going to get and the more we're going to pay individually. So they'd be better off to just let assets fall and go to the point where we actually know what their value is, uh, let the stock market go where it's going to go and get it over with have the flush, and then build a base. That's what we need. And it'll just take time to work its way out of it. What are your thoughts on this auto bailout? They've, they've kind of tabled it for now, which yeah. the market didn't like. What are your thoughts on that? I don't believe in bailing out anything, unfortunately, for most people. I know most people want a piece of the pie, but I guess here's how I feel about it. I, I filled up my gas tank at 450. Gas is now 198. I want my money back. Is that fair? It's not fair. You know, these guys made these loans. These car makers make terrible cars. They should be making, you know, 100-mile-per-gallon uh, cars at this point. Ford admitted that they had one on the board in 2000 that was going to get 75 miles to the gallon, and they decided that it would be an, uh, a dud for the economy. So they abandoned the plan. So they've made bad decisions. Why should we bail them out? And, and if we don't and, and those people lose their jobs, they're going to lose could their combine. jobs anyway. Okay. So you're saying there's no way to really avoid it. We're just putting off the inevitable. Unless, they, unless you say, let's take GM and Chrysler, put them together, take the good parts of Chrysler, the good parts of GM, put them together, and put in a new governing board, and by the way, we're going to make quality cars. If you do all that, then I would have the government invest. 
But none of that's going to happen. This is just going to be a handout, and it's going to be a Band-Aid, and the Band-Aid is going to break, and those people are still going to lose their jobs. Um, you know, one of my favorites uh, is if you had taken the money, the seven, $700 trillion or whatever, $700 billion, so it's going to be a trillion and a half when they finish. If you just taken the $700 trillion and given each person in America who's 18 years or older an equal share, we all would have got a check for $750,000. Don't you think the economy would be better? That sounds like it would be better. That sounds like an economic stimulus to me. I'd like the check. So I don't believe in bailing out any of these people. They made a decision. Let them live with it. Thanks for your time, Tim. My pleasure. You're watching the moneyshow.com video network. Well, every trader wants to know what it's going to take to be a success. And do successful traders share certain personality traits or just traits in general? Our guest today is Tim Morich, who's trained and, and seen many, many traders over the years. Tim, thanks for being here. My pleasure. All right. So do good traders have things in common that we can point to and say, I'm going to get that trade if I'm going to be successful in the markets? Absolutely. Uh, the be I know certainly the, what I think are the best traders in the world. Um, most of them are not common uh, names. Um, they like to be quiet. They're trading large amounts of money. They don't want to be followed. But that being said, they do share common traits, which and the, the biggest thing is um, they have set rules. They know themselves intimately. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. They never break their rules when they do. They take a time out, clear their head, get back to business. Um, this trading is a business. It's not fun time. You know, when things are going well, you, you can't be doing the happy dance. It's, you know, it's all about, you know, adhering to the rules and, uh, and never breaking them. And I've seen uh, some traders uh, that, that would have worked for me, um, you know, when I, when, I, when I ran stuff at institutions, ran large trading desks. Um, you'd see guys lose their edge and lose their ability to manage themselves and completely fall apart and never, and never catch it again. Do successful traders focus on one market and one strategy? Are they able to trade a lot of different markets at one time? It depends on the trader. I like to, you know, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm 53, I'm not that old, but I, you know, I, the older I get, the more simple I get. I, I, I tend to trade less markets. At one point, I probably traded 10 or 15 markets. Um, I portfolio trade 27 markets, but those trades can go 13, 14 months at a time, so there's not much attention to be paid. At the end of the day, you just check your stop loss and, and your, or your stop profit and put in your orders and make sure everything's okay. But in terms of intraday, I think you can probably pay attention to three or four things successfully. And, you know, the people that think that they can watch 20 things at once are kidding themselves. And you hear that every successful trader has an edge in some way. They don't take a trade unless they have an edge in that trade. Yes. What is that edge for, for most of these traders? For most of them, it's two things. It's the, that they, they have a solid money management uh, stop. They have an area that they can lean on. Um, you know, I was lucky enough early on uh, to, to be mentored by another great gentleman, Amos Hosteller, and uh, passed away, unfortunately, a long time ago, but probably the, the best person I know in money management. And uh, one of the things he taught us is, you know, and when I was at Commodities Corporation, when you first went there, if you were managing a large amount of money, you had to mentor people. And I was one of the regional mentors in the Midwest. And you'd go in his office, and he would play called, what he called a hat game. And he would take two hats, and he'd pass them. There'd be 10 of us. So he'd put a $1,000 bill on the table. Only time I've ever seen a $1,000 bill. And he'd pass the two hats, one, one each way, and you'd take out a slip. And one would be a commodity, and the other would be whether you're long or short. And this would be before the open. He'd say, okay, now you know your position. And come see me at the end of the day. At the end of the day, one of you gets $1,000, whoever makes the most money. You get one trade. End of discussion. And the idea was not to give $1,000 away. The idea was that he wanted his mentors to understand how important money management was. That you could take a random position, and if you analyze the market correctly and use good money management, you can make money. Now, sometimes the best trade was just to exit right at the opening. But, you know, that's a lesson you have to learn. The other thing that they have, and I think it's just become more and more, I've seen it become more and more important um, as I've taught people, is risk-reward. How much are you risking potentially when you put on the trade? And then afterwards, doing the analysis and say, how much did I actually make versus how much did I risk? And if the two are greatly different, your targets are probably unrealistic. So I would say great traders do two things. They're great at money management. And they always start out with good risk reward. I don't take anything less than three to one now. I've upped myself from two to one. Uh, the best trader I know in the world, um, he's at about five to one. But those are longer term trades. Right. Tim, thanks for your time. My pleasure. You're watching the moneyshow.com video network. 
I'm here with Tim Morge. He's a contributor to MoneyShow.com. Tim, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure. We talk about China in these interviews sure. that we do. We've done it uh, for a couple of years now. We've yes, done these we interviews. Have. Uh, we hear about the $4 trillion yuan stimulus plan for China. What effect do you think that has? Any trading opportunities there? I don't really think there are any trading opportunities per se. The market there is still closed. I have no idea why they haven't opened there. This is like, uh, I, as I said to you last time, boy, if you were ever going to open the doors and say, come on in and let me be the super currency, this would be the time. People would flock there to invest. I'm sure it's in their thoughts. I'm sure they're going to do it. I'm just, I don't know what's holding them up. Until that happens, though, they can do all they want. It'll have some inside value, but it has nothing to do with any of us. Will it have any ability for us to export to them, maybe increasing, helping our economy because they'll have more money to spend with us? Uh, perhaps, but they really are only, you know, they've been very smart in the last three or four years. When they change, they become, this is a bad connotation, but they become predators in the sense that they no longer call and, hey, what's your special price for me? Instead, they just call up and say, hey, send, over, send this over and send us a bill. I don't care what the price is. Across the board. Well, that continues, but those are only, they don't buy finished goods. They're only buying raw assets, and then they finish them inside of China for their own consumption. That's not going to help us. Well, when we talked maybe a year ago, and some of the people I've talked to, they said that even if the U.S. economy starts to go south a little bit, we've got China, we've got India right. that will boost us up because we'll be buying our stuff. Has that happened? No. So what, what's then to, to, to hold this up? Nothing. I, I, you know, I, I, I hate being the dire gentleman, but look, we're in trouble. Europe's in trouble. Christ, Iceland's out of money. Iceland, we, last week, I don't know if you realize this, we gave money to Mexico, Iceland, Singapore, Malaysia. I can't even remember the rest of the list. And the first thing that hit me was, first of all, we're broke. So what are we doing? Second of all, most of these countries don't even like us. And Mexico is a part of OPEC. Why don't they just go to OPEC? OPEC just got the greatest cash infusion in the history of the world from us in Europe. I would think they would just say to Mexico, no, hey, no worries. We got you covered. Instead, they came to us and like idiots, we gave them money. So I don't get it. I don't think we should be the banker to the world. I don't understand what the current administration is thinking, and I don't know where Mr. Obama is going to go. It'll be interesting to see. I was going to say, what do you think is going to change uh, after the inauguration? You know, I said this to you last time. It doesn't matter who wins because of my personal opinion is they don't have any tools to turn around. Only time is going to heal this wound. And if they, the best thing they can do is get out of the way, let the market take care of itself, um, and the wound is going to be deep, and it's going to take a long time to heal, probably four or five years. I would not want to be this president. You know, I think you dared me last time to use the Jimmy Carter expression, and I'm going to, I'll lay it on you. Uh, if you study the period, it's exactly the same as Jimmy Carter getting in. This is the first time since Jimmy Carter was elected that the Demo Democrats had more than 50% turnout, or 50% 50, 50 of the vote, excuse me. Um, there's pretty damn high, excuse my language, pretty damn high expectations on Mr. Obama Think of, he raised 12 million new voters for this election. If he doesn't come up with something in the next two years, I would hate to be running for Congress or Senate because there are going to be some pretty ugly people. You know, people are, are comparing him to John F. Kennedy. Well, John F. Kennedy didn't have a rotting uh, country, uh, runaway inflation, um, the world about to go into a depression. I mean, it's not a fair comparison. It's not fair to Obama. So I, don't think, I really don't think that he's going to be the player. I, I'd like to be wrong. I really would because, you know, I live in this country and I'm going to continue to live in this country, but I really think it's not up to the president. I think it's much more up to the Treasury or the Fed. A lot of uncertainty out there. A lot of uncertainty, yes. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure. You're watching the MoneyShow.com video network.